Hi everyone, this lesson is on the psychological effect known as the priming effect. So the priming effect is a psychological phenomenon that occurs when an individual is exposed to information, and this information is often going to come in the form of a word or some kind of a stimulus or emotion, that increases the likelihood that the same or similar information will be repeated by the individual. So if it's a word that they hear, the priming effect states that they're more likely to use that word later in the same conversation, for instance. So the priming effect is often going to occur without conscious awareness, and it's going to occur through activation of what we call associative networks. So associative networks are going to be networks of thoughts or words or ideas that are connected to each other. So it's, again, going to be a network of related ideas, and often it's going to be words or thoughts or certain stimuli. And each individual is going to have a different associative network that has been formed by their prior experiences. So depending on their prior experiences or, for instance, their education level, they're going to have different associative networks. So they're going to have different connections between words, thoughts, or ideas. And these associative networks are essentially networks of neurons in someone's brain. So if someone is exposed to a certain word, it's going to activate the neurons for that word, but it's also going to activate neurons that are connected with regard to meaning with that word itself. So we're going to show an example to better solidify what I mean here. And then we're also going to talk about a special case of the priming effect later on in this lesson known as the idiomotor effect that involves unconscious behavioral changes due to exposure of words or information. So it's not going to be just simply a increased likelihood of words being used after hearing a word. It's actually going to be unconscious behavioral change. So behavioral change that the person is not even aware of that has been influenced by words they hear. So we'll talk about some examples of that later on in this lesson as well. So let's talk about an example of an associated network. So if a person has been presented with a word or an image of a banana, for instance, it's going to activate a set of neurons in their brain for banana. But that idea of a banana or that concept of a banana is going to be connected to other ideas. So it's going to be connected in a sort of a network of similar meaning. So for instance, a connected idea or connected concept to a banana would be another fruit like an apricot or a mango. So a yellow fruit, for instance. So if you're presented with a yellow banana, you may be more likely to think about another yellow fruit. Or you may even just think of fruits in general, or the word fruit. And then further away from this connection may be the concept of the color yellow itself. And then other fruits that are not yellow, like an apple. And then further away ideas as well. So you can see how an associated network is again a network of concepts that are related to each other. So when you're presented with the word banana or an image of a banana, you're going to have an activation of neurons that involve the concept of banana, but also other neurons for other concepts that are associated with the concept of a banana. And this is all going to occur spontaneously and without conscious awareness. And again, it's going to depend on the prior experiences of the individual. If they don't know of the fruit mango or it's been something they've only seen very rarely, it may not be an idea or concept that is closely associated with a banana. So again, it's going to be determined by the person's prior experiences. And this is just an example of an associate network. There's going to be many, many more concepts that are within this associated network. So one example may be the fact that if someone's presented with the word food and they are told to solve this word puzzle, they're more likely to come up with the word soup as opposed to soap. So because there is an associated network that has been activated when they have been exposed to the word food, and there is some connection with the word food and the concept and word of soup, they're more likely to actually select or think about soup when they see this word puzzle as opposed to soap. So not only does prior exposure to certain information make other information more likely to be utilized or thought of spontaneously, but even using a particular word like priming, if someone were to use that word, that word is going to be more likely to be used by the recipient in the same conversation. And this can apply to many different words. So for instance, if one person uses the word amalgamate in a conversation, a word that's not used commonly, and the other person hears that word and understands that word, they're more likely to use that word in the conversation as well. So they're more likely to use amalgamate in some other context or during the same conversation. So this is the effect of priming. Now let's talk about the idiomotor effect. So the idiomotor effect is 
an unconscious behavioral change that is induced by exposure to certain information like words and thoughts. So this is going to involve receiving information and then enacting a behavioral change after being exposed to that information. And that behavioral change is going to be unconscious. It's not going to occur within the awareness of the person. So there was a study that exposed college students to different sets of words. One group of students was exposed to a variety of different words, but they were not exposed to words associated with old age. They were exposed to words that were not related to old age. Whereas the other group of students was exposed to words associated with old age without them being explicitly told old age or elderly. So some of these words may include gray or frail. So not going to be words that are directly about old age, but they are associated with old age. And in the study, after those students were exposed to different sets of words, they were then let out of the room that they were in and they walked down a hall. And that was actually part of the experiment, walking down a hall to see how fast they would walk. In the group that was exposed to words not related to old age, they walked normal. They walked in their normal fashion. But in individuals who are exposed to words associated with old age, like gray or frail, they actually walked or moved slower. So they walked more like what they would believe a typical older person or elderly person would walk. So this is fascinating. And it's often difficult to believe, in fact, but there is a lot of evidence showing that this effect does occur. So again, exposure to certain words can impact or induce certain behavioral change, even without the person being aware of it. So that is the ideomotor effect. So the ideomotor effect was a special case of the priming effect. And the last thing I want to talk about here is what we call reciprocal priming effects. So reciprocal priming effects occur when behaviors induce or elicit thoughts or ideas. And one example would be feelings. So it's not going to be the words or thoughts that influence the behavior. It's going to be the behavior that influences the words or thoughts or feelings. So we'll talk about one example here. So one example would be where somebody is exposed to words or thoughts or feelings of amusement and or happiness. So they feel happy or feel amused for whatever reason. Maybe they're exposed to some comedy or something else that would induce their feeling of amusement or happiness. And this is going to cause them to smile. So this is going to be the natural response. But interestingly enough, if someone smiles, that actually increases their likelihood that they're going to feel amused or happy. So it can be a reciprocal priming effect. So even without the exposure of something that's funny or something that makes somebody happy, if you're just a voluntarily small and doesn't have to be for any reason, this can increase the likelihood that you're going to have subjective feelings or thoughts of being happy or being contented. So this is very interesting. This also occurs with frowning. So if you were to put something in somebody's mouth to make them frown, they actually will feel sadder than they would otherwise. So there have been studies on this. If you have somebody voluntarily smile or have something in their mouth that requires them to form a smile and you have them watch something that is generally amusing or funny, they are going to find that particular thing they're watching even more amusing or funny. And on the other side of this, if you have that person voluntarily frown or put something in their mouth that forces them to frown or have the shape of a frown and they watch that same thing, they watch that amusing video, for instance, they will actually find it less amusing. So there is a very important connection between not only your thoughts and feelings and the way you behave, but the way you behave and your thoughts and feelings. So that is reciprocal priming effects. If you want to learn more about other psychological effects, please check out my psychology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.